Thank you all for coming to our lunch event. Um, we're going to keep this introduction a little short because our time here is limited. But on behalf of the Law and Political Economy group here, the Environmental Law Society, the Black Law Students Association, the Human Rights Association, the Society for International Law, and um, the SEPA Student Government, we are very excited to introduce Professor Fado Kaboob. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to, to be back. Um, uh, the first time I was here, I think, in this very same auditorium, I was also invited by a student group uh, here at Columbia Law, and uh, one of those students, I think, who introduced me is sitting in the back here. Um, so it's, it's, it's a special place, and I'm um, grateful for, for your time and for, for the invitation. Um, my name is Fadel Kaboob. I normally teach economics at Denison University in Ohio. I'm currently on leave uh, and spending time in Nairobi, Kenya, doing climate and uh, development policy across uh, the African continent, partly based with an organization called Power Shift Africa, uh, based in Nairobi. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is decolonizing international law and economics. Um, and if if you're pressed for time, the, the main message <laughs> in one slide um, is, is this. We can't decolonize a system, we can't decarbonize a system that hasn't been decolonized yet. And I'll help unpack that. Similarly, you can't democratize a system that hasn't been decolonized yet. And you can add a lot of Ds to this story. You can't de-dollarize a system that hasn't been decolonized yet. There's a lot of interest in the global south and the BRICS. And how do we de-dollarize the financial system and the hegemony of the US dollar? Very important conversations, but if you're not addressing the deep structural economic and legal mechanisms that have been present during colonial times and reinforced, further reinforced during post-colonial times, we're essentially not going to go anywhere in those efforts. That's my argument. Uh, and, and here's how I would like to unpack it. Uh, I have a few copies of this report here. You're more than welcome to take all of them. Uh, it's also available online, the Just Transition report, which was uh, done by a group of independent experts uh, over the last year commissioned or gathered together by um, Yuba Sekona, who's the outgoing vice chair of the IPCC uh, from Mali. Um, the main message here is really that decolonization of the economy, but with the focus on climate, energy, and development policies. And typically these policies are discussed in silos. And what we try to do in this report and this work is to make sure that we're addressing climate, energy, and development policies simultaneously, addressing the root causes of, of the challenges. And I'm, I'm often reminded of the words of Martin Luther King in the context of the civil rights movement when I'm doing this type of work, where he essentially said something to the effect, I have no time for the tranquilizing drugs of gradualism and incrementalism when you're talking about the urgency of, of the climate crisis, of the inequality crisis, these incremental small solutions that tend to operate at the surface are not really uh, worth our time. They're distractions, dangerous distractions. Uh, similarly, when you think of these structural problems that have deep roots, we have to be radicals in our thinking. And radical, not in the ugly political sense of the term that most people usually reject. I mean, think of it literally. What does radical mean? It means going to the roots of the problem. And we want to address the roots of these problems. And if I'm not radical in my approach, then I'm operating at the surface. I'm superficial. I'm perpetuating the status quo. So which is it? Do we want radical, transformative solutions? or superficial band-aid solutions, tranquilizing drugs. That's the way we should be thinking about these massive problems, massive crises that we're dealing with. Either you're radical or you're wasting our time. 
The climate crisis, very simple picture that I'll explain in, in two words, in, in a few words. The, the United Nations Environmental Program a couple of years ago produced this report, uh, report called the production gap. You can look it up. Uh, and they've updated it uh, a couple of years ago also. What does the production gap say? It's basically looking at two things. How much we're planning to extract and burn by 2030, 2040 in terms of fossil fuels versus how much we should be allowed to extract and burn by 2030, 2040. And the gap is, is what you see there. We're on track to extract and burn twice as much as we're allowed to if we're going to meet the climate challenge. So this means, very, in very simple terms, the only way we're going to meet the climate challenge is doing two things. One, we stop adding fossil fuel infrastructure that's meant to be producing and burning fossil fuels for the next 50 years. And currently, we're on, on the, the pace we're using right now, we're adding close to a trillion dollars of new fossil fuel infrastructure every year. Most of it in North America, by the way, between the US and Canada. So we have to be very clear about what we're actually doing right now as we pretend we're trying to deal with the climate crisis. And number two, what this production gap report tells us is, you know, stop adding new infrastructure and then design a plan to rapidly phase out existing fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, and, and hence, I'm, I'm part of this effort, global effort, uh, and I invite all of you to check it out. It's called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. And hundreds of, uh, you know, uh, people around the world, organizations, faith groups, Nobel laureates, uh, diplomats have endorsed the idea of sitting down and negotiating this. And now we're up to, you know, uh, almost 10 countries, mostly small Pacific Island nations, who have endorsed the treaty idea uh, at the national level, not just cities and municipalities. So this is this is an effort that needs to happen. Sooner or later, we will need to do this. And phasing out fossil fuels needs to come with a just transition, needs to come with an economic vision, an economic plan to rebalance uh, the global economy. Um, and, and that's part of the message that I would like to uh, deliver today. The World Bank, not your most progressive climate organization on the planet, produced this report called, called Groundswell, also a couple of years ago, estimating the number of people who will be displaced because of climate events. Call them climate refugees, climate, you know, displaced people. We're talking about close to 200, more than 200 million people by 2050, some of whom are already displaced as we speak. And when you talk about this type of displacement, it puts pressure on the receiving countries or regions on housing, on education, on schools, on uh, food and often these things lead to conflict and they have led to conflicts in the past this is not something we're prepared for economically or logistically which means doubling our efforts towards climate adaptation not just mitigation is a must and unfortunately that's not what's what's happening so this is the picture I often ask people to take a selfie with and it's a bit complicated, but I'll explain it in simple terms. Focus on that green line and think of the world in two blocks, global north and global south, rich and poor countries, and then net out all global financial transactions, trade, foreign direct investment, interest payment, charity, remittances from workers, everything included. The net amount is that green line, which is the last figure we have there is $2 trillion moving from the poorest countries to the richest countries. And notice that number has been accelerating. Well, when I was in school, almost more than 20 years ago, the number was 500 billion. And we thought it was outrageous that the global north is sucking $500 billion a year from the poorest countries. And now it's 2 trillion. And if we don't do anything about the global financial trade and investment architecture, I guarantee you that number will be 5, 6, 10 trillion dollars in the next decade or two. That's money moving in the wrong direction as we pretend to, you know, put all of our efforts into climate finance and adaptation and, and all of that. So this is a neocolonial extractive system. And I'll explain what I mean by that in the next few slides. Um, 
To put things in context, that $2 trillion moving in the wrong direction, that big red circle there with the $2 trillion number in it, put it side by side with the promise from almost 15 years ago in Copenhagen for $100 billion delivered to countries that need the adaptation and mitigation finance. That's $100 billion. Most of it was not delivered. 80% of it is loans, aka debt traps. Put it side by side with the Green Climate Fund, which is more democratic, established more democratically. Last time I checked, I'll update the number, it's a, close to $12 billion for the entire global south. Again, a lot of it is loans, concessional loans, but still loans. And that white dot right there that you can't see, your eyesight is okay. That's the loss and damage fund that was created last year in Sharm el Sheikh that remains empty. And uh, Mr. Kerry told us a few weeks ago that the U.S. will not pay reparations, climate reparations, to developing countries. So that's, that's the summary of the picture. Are we putting in place any radical transformative solutions today, or are we presenting false solutions that don't even come close to the scale of intervention needed. So that's another picture you can take a selfie with. So what are the structural deficiencies in the Global South that actually produce that outflow of, of $2 trillion from the Global South? Yes, of course, external debt is a big problem, and it's the focus of most conversations today, even in the climate space. But it's a symptom of much deeper structural issues. And there are, there are three major structural problems. Number one, food deficits in the Global South. Africa today imports 85% of its food, not by accident, by design. We used to be the breadbasket of the world during colonial times. As soon as the colonial forces left in the early 50s and started to leave, there was a meeting in Rome in 1955 where the Europeans said, we have a problem. We have a food problem. We depend on the Global South for food imports. That's not good. So series of conversations started, led to 1962, the Common Agricultural Policy, CAP, which is in place to this day, which is what? Heavy subsidies to European agriculture for core crop production, wheat, corn, barley, soybean, not the complementary stuff, the fruits and vegetables, those are important too. So, and it wasn't just Europe, I'm not singling out Europe here, the US did the same, Japan, Australia, Canada, you name it. And the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, which is Russia and the Ukraine at the time. So what did these major food producers do? They heavily subsidized wheat and corn and rice production and so on. And our farmers in the Global South were not subsidized. So now, as a farmer, you can't compete in this space. What do you have to do? You either give up farming and move to urban areas and try to make a living somehow, or you have to switch crops. You start producing cash crops for exports, fruits and vegetables and tomatoes and things that you can export to the Global North. So the concept of food security was invented during that time. Food security means you can secure the nutrition of your people either by producing it, or by buying it from abroad, or by borrowing money to buy it from abroad, or by receiving it as charity. The point is you secure people's nutrition. That's not the same thing as food sovereignty, right? which is the important concept we need to revive in, in this effort. So when you focus on cash crop exports, you have to serve the taste of your consumers in Switzerland or Germany or whatever, which means the tomatoes you produce, the strawberries you produce, they have to survive the journey and look picture perfect like a magazine thing. And they have to look so perfect that not a single you know, bug wants to come close to it. <laughs> it has to be toxic enough. So you have to pump it with fertilizers and pesticides to produce for exports. And you have to build massive logistical capabilities for those crops to survive the journey, all of which you have to import including eventually the seeds that you plant have to be imported. And you do that for 10, 15 years, and you've just destroyed the fertility of your soil. Yield starts to decline, so you have to double down on those efforts, import even more powerful seeds, more powerful fertilizers, more powerful pesticides. And that's how today we import 85% of our food. 
This is not sustainable economically, ecologically, um, uh, in, in the global south. Energy deficits. Here I'm including a country even like Nigeria, major, the major producer of oil in Africa. Nigeria today imports 100% of its gasoline. Gasoline that's actually illegal to sell in Europe, as if burning those particles in Africa versus Amsterdam makes a difference globally. Again, not by accident, by design. And number three, low value added manufacturing, where the global south has been assigned the role of either extractivism with no value added or assembly line manufacturing, where you have to import the technology, import the intermediate components, import the energy to run the factories, and import the packaging even, in many cases. So everything you import is high value added content. Everything you export is low value added content, racing to the bottom with lower wages. No matter how much you double, triple, quadruple your exports, you're always digging yourself deeper in that, in that hole. So you take these three structural deficiencies, put them together, you have a trade deficit. And if you've taken economics or heard about economics, a trade deficit in simple terms means your currency becomes weaker relative to the dollar, relative to the euro. So with a weaker currency, anything you want to buy the next morning, whether it's food or fuel or medicine for your people, will cost you more. So you're literally importing inflation, food inflation, energy inflation, pharmaceutical products inflation, very sensitive items that no country can afford to let the most vulnerable people suffer that type of inflation. So what do we do? We immediately play defense. You step in as a government and you subsidize food, subsidize fuel to support the most vulnerable. And then you ask the central bank to help strengthen the exchange rate, strengthen your currency relative to the dollar, or at least stop the decline in the value of your currency, stop the currency depreciation. And it's done in very simple band-aid format for decades, which is the central bank borrows dollars or euros or British pounds and steps into the foreign exchange market to artificially use those dollars to buy their own currency, create artificial demand for their currency to raise the value of that currency. And to buy your own currency with dollars, you have to have dollars, which you don't have in the first place. So hence the debt cycle begins and accelerates. And this is year after year after year, right? And it becomes unsustainable. So to prevent the social unrest that would happen from, you know, food riots and, and things like that, that we've seen in my own country in, in Tunisia, you have to pursue these band-aid solutions. And of course, you're operating at the surface. You're not addressing the roots of the problem. The roots of the problem are food deficits, energy deficits, and the industrialization deficits. So the solutions are right there, staring us at the face. You invest in food sovereignty and agroecology. You invest in renewable energy sovereignty. You invest in a different kind of industrial strategy that allows you to climb up the ladder of the value chain over time. Those are the solutions. And they're easier said than done, but they need to be done. And what I'll discuss here is what it takes to, to get there. Um, I'll, just to show you the numbers, you can eyeball the problem right here. This is Africa as a whole, exports. You can see the composition of exports. It's mostly raw materials and, and cash crops. And notice the, the number is $585 billion, right? And I picked 2019 on purpose to avoid the COVID thing, but it's not any different before or after COVID. And here's Africa's imports. Look at the number, $737 billion, structural deficit. Look at the composition of Africa's imports, much more sophisticated uh, value added content embedded in all of those products. I'll give you country after country after country. I'll just pick Ghana here. Look at Ghana's exports, $25 billion. You can eyeball the composition of their exports, gold, and crude oil, basically. Look at Ghana's imports, $27 billion, and the composition is much more sophisticated. So this creates this downward pressure on Ghana's exchange rate. When the line is going up relative to the dollars, Ghana's currency getting weaker and weaker relative to the dollar. And the flip side of it is the external debt that's growing exponentially. And there is no stopping it unless you address the roots of the problem. So most 
discussions today in, on the external debt front, on restructuring the global financial architecture, even on climate finance, is focused on the debt. And what are the limits or the parameters of this discussion? We need lower interest rates. We need to restructure, right? We need to have more concessional loans. It's helpful, but it's not going to address the roots of the problem. Until we have global financial architecture discussions that go into the food issues, the energy issues, the industrialization issues, we're not going to have the transformation needed. We'll, we'll have a little bit of relief and we'll be back to the same cycle almost immediately. And here we're talking about the global financial trade investment architecture that was not designed by us, the global south, not designed for us. It's not going to be the same architecture that will save us today in this poly crisis uh, environment. And, and the system was designed in 1944. There's only three African countries present at Bretton Woods. And you can argue about whether they were sovereign or not even in that, in that case. That's not the system that will deliver justice or transformation today. Um, so the, the mainstream policies that we've been using for decades, and they're still the same policies, austerity, debt restructuring, privatizing state-owned enterprises, you know, generate cash from selling the telecom, the airline, the airport. You know, once you do it, you spend the money, you can't privatize the airline twice or it's gone, right? Uh, labor market flexibility, that's code word for race to the bottom. Uh, foreign direct investment and export-led growth, which even in the climate space, we're told these are the things that will generate climate finance and the fiscal space that you need. The thing is, if you're locked at the bottom of the value chain, no matter how much you accelerate your exports, you're always digging yourself deeper. With foreign direct investment, it's even more extractive because profits are repatriated. They're not even reinvested in, in the country. Um, financial liberalization, you know, set up a little Wall Street and attract speculators from around the globe. We've tried this in Mexico and Turkey and uh, Brazil and, you know, the hot money problem, right? You deregulate, artificially create high returns. You get a lot of cash coming in. And then at the first rumor of inflation or instability, all of it leaves. You have a market crash and a currency crisis, and you're back to square one because you're exclusively attracting speculators. Tourism, this is meant to be like the magical solution, right? Because what's not to like about tourism? Millions of people coming with dollars and euros, creating jobs in the hotels and entertainment industry. What's the problem? Well, if you don't have food sovereignty or energy sovereignty, you bring 10 million tourists, you have to feed them. So you have to import food that you don't have. You have to transport them, heat and cool the hotels for them. So you have to import more energy that you don't have. So the net effect of tourism in many developing countries is a net negative, actually. But nobody sees it because we just see the dollars coming in with the tourists, not recognizing that we're bleeding resources, including dollars, in, in that situation. But if you have food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, yes, tourism can be a, a net positive. And of course, we want it to be green and sustainable and ecological and focused on cultural heritage, all that good stuff. But fundamentally, it's a trap. Remittances, of course, the flip side of it is, is brain drain, and, and that's not sustainable in the global south. And you end up with a race to the bottom, more external debt, and we're told there is no alternative. These are the solutions. You got to do it. Do more, do it with integrity, with transparency, with democracy, with, with everything, you know, all the beautiful stuff, but do it. <laughs> and somehow it's supposed to work, right? So that's the trap that we're talking about. So are countries prepared, for example, to accommodate the, the mass climate migration that is already unfolding that I showed a little bit ago? Do we have the fiscal capacity to pay for it without causing inflation, without bankrupting nations, and, and so on. So the economics of it is, is important. And here I, I bring in what I call the spectrum of monetary sovereignty, that not all countries have the same degree of monetary sovereignty. Some countries have no monetary sovereignty whatsoever. A country like Ecuador, that dollarized, doesn't have a national currency to begin with. Or countries in Africa in the CFA franc zone, the French colonial currency that's still in place to this day, Yes, French colonial currency that don't control even the monetary creation in, in their own countries, right? Versus countries with high degree of monetary sovereignty, like the US, like Japan, um, 
And what determines where you sit on that, spe on that spectrum of monetary sovereignty, which gives you either more or less fiscal spending capacity to spend on national priorities, on climate action, for example, are a few things. One is, yes, you create your own currency. The U.S., we do that. You tax the population in the same national currency. The U.S., we do that, right? But then three and four are even more important, which is, number one, your debt, your national debt, government debt, must be denominated in the same national currency. All the U.S. debt is denominated in dollars. All the Japanese debt is denominated in, US, uh, in Japanese yen. And number four, which is related to three, you're not in a position where you have to constantly defend the value of your currency, which is what most countries in the global south do. In the U.S., the value of the dollar can go up, can go down. You know, some people like it, some people don't like it, but it doesn't disrupt your economy. In the global south, we borrow in dollars and euros, foreign currencies. And as a result, because of the structural trade deficit, we're forced to constantly play defense and defend the value of the exchange rate. Otherwise, with the, everything we import the next morning will be more expensive. We have bread riots. So the central bank is constantly borrowing more dollars to defend the value of the exchange rate. So most of the global south is in that zone with limited degree of monetary sovereignty or no monetary sovereignty. So most of my work is how do we get countries to move to the higher end of the spectrum so they can have more autonomy, more spending on national priorities as opposed to constantly playing defense. And it's not something that you can declare by decree. Say today we have more economic and monetary sovereignty. It's something that you earn, that you acquire with strategic transformative investments. And if somebody wants to help from the global north, you help in those strategic investments. And that's not happening. So how much can a country spend safely without causing inflation, whether it's global south or global north? We're told, well, taxes, right? You gather taxes and you spend. Maybe you can borrow a little bit, up to a certain point. Don't, don't go crazy with the borrowing. But what I'm arguing here is that there's this additional spending capacity that we're almost never tapping into. Sometimes we do like COVID situation, things like that. Notice it's not infinite. It's constrained by the in risk of inflation. So I become obsessed with what determines that risk of inflation? What determines that bright yellow space? Is it big? Is it small? Can we stretch it out with strategies? And that risk of inflation is determined by two things. Number one, lack of productive capacity, which includes logistics and supply, supply chains capabilities. So a government can spend more and create more income, create more jobs, that income will be used by consumers to spend in a free country. But if whatever they spend on, say food or fuel, is not available domestically, because there is no domestic productive capacity, it's gonna cause inflation. And that's gonna limit how much you can spend. So the good news here is that productive capacity is producible. You can produce more food, you can produce more energy. Again, with strategies, not with wishful thinking. And number two, what causes that risk of inflation to materialize is abusive market power and price setting behavior. And you're not gonna get rid of inflation risk by spending less and imposing austerity. You get rid of abusive market power by taxing and regulating abusive market power out of existence with antitrust regulations, go, going after cartels. So if you manage to put together a strategy that does both, build productive capacity in key areas, especially food and energy in the global south, and go after cartels, go after price setters with regulation, then you can stretch that additional fiscal space domestically without help from outside to actually tackle the national priorities, including climate adaptation. Of course, help from the outside in this direction is welcome but it's not happening. And that's the paradigm shift that, that needs to happen. Um, I'll give you quick examples of why people say, no, 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 you can't do that. We've tried it, look at, you know, Venezuela, hyperinflation, all of that, don't, don't even go there. So this is the mainstream logic. I pick my country here as an example. If Tunisia decides to spend 2 billion dinars, national currency, not from abroad, on health and education, Here's what they're gonna say. You're gonna import more food and, and energy and medical equipment. You're gonna have a larger trade deficit. You're gonna have a weaker exchange rate, bigger deficit, right? 
you're going to have this pass-through inflation effect, right? You'll start importing inflation, even hyperinflation, if you do that for a long time. And as a result, you're going to have more external debt, right? You're not solving the problem. The IMF and other lenders will come in and say, you need spending cuts, you need austerity. So you go back to square one, less investment in health and education, more unemployment, brain drain, social, economic, political tensions, don't even try. This, is, this does not work. There is no alternative. We heard it from Margaret Thatcher a long time ago. So that's the mainstream logic. Don't even try to go there, right? So here's the MMT approach, modern monetary theory, or the alternative approach. If Tunisia spends the same amount, 2 billion dinars, the same amount I showed in the first scenario, but differently and strategically, so you spend 1 billion on health and education, the priority, and the other billion, you spend it in strategic investments, in food sovereignty, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and you crack down on price setters and abusive market power via taxation, regulation, antitrust laws, and, and so on. So the same amount of spending, but with, with a coherent strategy. You're going to have fewer imports of food and energy because you're producing more locally. You're going to have a lower trade deficit because these are the biggest components of your structural problem. You're going to have a stable, even stronger exchange rate, actually, because you have a lower deficit, no inflation effect, lower external debt over time, and higher credit ratings from credit rating agencies. You're going to increase your foreign currency reserves at the central bank because you're not bleeding cash importing food and energy. You're going to have more resilience to external shocks on food, on energy uh, security front. And you're going to have a lower carbon footprint and more employment, less brain drain, improved quality of life for all. Now we're talking. So the question becomes, is Tunisia's fiscal policy space limited to these 2 billion dinars? Or is it maybe 2.5? Maybe it's 7. Who knows, maybe it's 12. What determines that limit? that you can dedicate to transformative national priorities. It's not some random number that you pick up with 3% of a deficit or budget or whatever. It's, again, going back to that red barrier, the inflation risk. Do you have the physical productive capacity, the skilled labor to dedicate to additional investments? If you do, then you can spend more. Do you have the administrative regulatory capacity to crack down on abusive market power and regulation to administer additional spending? If you do, then you can spend more. And if you don't, that's your limit. And then you know what you need to work on. But the idea that there is no fiscal space available and it cannot be created is a myth. And that's really the idea. It's also important to know what not to do if we're trying to tackle these, these issues, whether it's climate or health or education, don't accelerate the engines of external debt. Don't accelerate the engines of extractivism. Don't accelerate brain drain. Uh, don't encourage low value added assembly line industrialization. Don't accelerate exports of cash crops. That's been the major trap of development. Don't encourage investments in fossil fuels and create more stranded assets that you'll be left holding the bag, as they say. Don't encourage consumerism. This is an important factor here. Don't turn a blind eye on illicit financial transactions, on corruption, on abusive market power, and don't perpetuate the, perpetuate the engines of the status quo, which is essentially what most policy action has been focused on status quo enhancing policies and, and strategies. So the structural solutions, as I outlined, Earlier, as we outlined in, in this report, again, I invite all of you to take a look at it and, and grab a few of these hard copies. Pan-African cooperation, and why I say Pan-African as opposed to national policies, um, in three key areas, food sovereignty and agroecology, renewable energy sovereignty, and high value added industrial policies. Some countries will not be able to produce everything they need in, on the food front. Some countries just can't. Uh, some countries don't have the renewable energy capacity. So you need to think in terms of regional, sub-regional, pan-African cooperation to produce kind of blocks of countries that can support each other in these core areas. But most importantly, on industrialization. No country can industrialize if it has a small internal market. 
because when you industrialize for manufacturing, you need economies of scale. Economies of scale meaning when you produce more and more units, the cost per unit goes down, the quality improves, efficiency improves, and you can improve customer service and technology and everything. So you need scale. That's what industrialization is about. Under the current system, a country of 10, 20, even 30 million consumers, you can't hit those economies of scale with your domestic market. You just saturate the market very quickly. So you need outlets in a much larger market. Under the current global trade system, good luck competing with made in Germany, made in Japan, made in the global north. It's just not going to happen. You try and they say, oh, great, you're trying to industrialize. Let's work together. How about you assemble this stuff for us? <laughs> how about you just package it, right? So you're locked at the bottom of the value chain. Or how about you produce just one component, produce like 700 million units of it, we'll buy it from you, and we'll take care of the rest. So you're locked at the bottom of the value chain. But when it comes to the priorities of the global south today, one of the biggest priorities is in Africa in particular, is bringing electricity to the 600 million people today who don't have any electricity. Bringing clean cooking infrastructure to the, seven, to the 970 million Africans who have no access to clean cooking technology, mostly women and children, daily inhaling toxic fumes. So that's an industrialization opportunity. You have the scale, you have the need, and it's a basic building block of development of prosperity. No country can function without food, without energy. It's just as simple as that. And we tend to skip those two basic pillars and focus on other things. So the opportunity here, in the African continent in particular, we have all the strategic minerals needed for industrialization, for high-tech industrialization, for clean cooking, for renewable energy infrastructure. We have the complementarity of resources and human capabilities. What we may lack is the manufacturing capabilities, the technology. And this is where, when you form a united front, saying we have all the resources, all the capability, and we have a vision for our own development on our own terms. Now we're looking for partners. Partners as in actual partners. It could be China, it could be Japan, it could be the US, it could be Germany, it doesn't matter. Like Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados says, friends of all, satellites of none. We want to partner, right? This is, this is shifting the geopolitical map of the world a little bit, but it's not about Africa dominating the world and saying nobody's going to have access to critical minerals unless you give us this, that, and the other. It's about rebalancing the global economy. And it's a win-win for, for everybody. So that's why on this front, you have to have Global South cooperation to form that bargaining chip. And if you just own a slice of a bargaining chip, it's useless. You know, you, you don't get much, right? And that's the transformation that is, that is needed. And of course, in addition to the transformation of global financial and trade architecture that, that I discussed earlier. And, and look at the potential, the renewable energy potential just of the African continent. This is gonna be the leapfrog moment of the continent. And here, when, I'm, when I talk about these things, it's really about, we're talking about resetting the global geopolitical space. And I'll summarize it in, in a few sentences. And this is why it's important for Africa in particular, the global south in general, to think in these terms. There are three major economic blocks today. There's the US, Europe, and China. And each one of these blocks has a vision for itself for the next 100 years. And every block has every right to have a vision for itself and has every right to use its economic diplomacy and incentives to nudge everybody else to where they want to see them on that map. Everybody has the right to do that. The problem is we in the Global South don't have a vision for ourselves. And when you don't have a vision for yourself, I guarantee you, you're part of somebody else's vision. They have a plan for you. And the role that we've been assigned historically, and unfortunately that's the same role that they see us play in the future for things. They see us as the place for cheap raw materials. They see us as the place where industrial output from the global north is dumped. They see us as the place for low cost tourist destinations, exotic tourist destinations. And they see us as the place where obsolete assembly line manufacturing that is no longer needed in the global north is delivered to us as aid and cooperation and technical assistance.
four things. And the global south cannot afford to accept that role moving forward if we're going to deliver justice, if we're going to deliver just transition, if we're trying to rebalance the global economy, that can't be the solution. That can't be the role that we play. So going back to the three structural transformations, investments in food sovereignty and agroecology, that's a development transformation policy, but it's also climate policy. Going to renewable energy investments that are needed in the global south, that's a development transformation policy, but it's also climate policy. What a coincidence. Going to the industrialization priority in the global south, that's a development transformation to rebalance the global economy, to eliminate the need for external debt and all these debt traps. But that's also, what a coincidence, that's climate policy. So it's a win-win on all fronts. And the world cannot afford continuing with $2 trillion moving in the wrong direction. And we're pretending to deliver aid and cooperation and technical assistance in crumbs to the global south. So that's really the... Uh, the main message. So I, I talked about the, the importance of industrial strategies, uh, but if, if you as a country or as a block of countries don't have the minimal level of resilience, then you don't have any bargaining chips. You, you can't walk away from a negotiation table if you know your people are going to starve the next day and, and because you're not paying, paying the debt. So I'll, I'll skip this part. So to summarize, how do we see this global north, global north, global south. Global south, low degree of monetary sovereignty, no, not responsible for climate change. Africa is responsible for less than 4% of global emissions. That's Spain alone emits 4%. High external debt, and I have no problem with Spain, it just happens to be the same number. Uh, I love Spain. High external debt, uh, low productive capacity, low research and development capacity, and suffers from this neo-colonial extractive economic system. On the other hand, the global north, high degree of monetary sovereignty, is responsible for climate change, climate debt, let's call it, uh, has low to no external debt to speak of, high productive capacity, high research and development capacity, so it does have the technical capabilities to actually deliver change and obviously benefits from this extractive, neo-colonial extractive system. So what we're talking about when we talk about rebalancing the global economy, we're talking about repairing a broken system, which is why I think of this in terms of climate reparations, colonial, neo-colonial reparations. And when we think of reparations, we have to tell the truth about what's happened. We have to expose this truth as opposed to say, oh yeah, there's climate change and we're trying to help and we're so generous but you know we're not really responsible for it we didn't know and even when we found out we didn't really care so telling the truth in, in the sense of national global regional truth and reconciliation commissions on on what what the damage was on all these fronts if we're trying to heal the planet right if we're trying to heal humanity a formal apology as opposed to saying no we're not you know we're not going to deliver any of that. And then the reparations itself. This is the part that interests me. How do you repair these faulty structures? Yes, there will be monetary compensation, paying for the climate debt, because we've exhausted our carbon budget in the global north, and we owe that debt. But it's not sufficient. You have to repair the structures that we talked about. You start with debt cancellation, external debt cancellation, debts that have been paid many times over and repairing the global trade, finance, and investment architecture that is deeply colonial, that creates that suction mechanism of $2 trillion a year and rising. And you have to prioritize not just mitigation, but also adaptation, which is missing from my slide here. And transfer of technology and research and development capabilities has to be part of the reparations, because if you're trying to build resilience in the global south, it's not just enough to say, well, we'll give you a loan or we'll give you a gift in the form of this technology. You have to rebalance the creation and use of technology as opposed to create more debt trap mechanisms via technology. And of course, taxation and regulation at the national, but also on a global level is part of a reparations framework. And 
to close with with the legal framework where a lot of legal work needs to be done and legal innovation you start with the historical precedents we have the, the odious uh, debt doctrine which i don't know if um, most of you are familiar with it uh, alexander sachs more than 100 years ago came up with this concept that's been used actually in debt cancellation cases legal cases mostly by the u.s by the way we basically said there's three things that must apply for debt to be cancelled legally one the money was borrowed without the consent of the people you can look at a lot of cases where non-democratic governments two which is very important the money was not used to benefit the people and three most importantly the lenders knew about it knew that the money was not borrowed with the consent of the people and didn't benefit the people the iraqi debt was cancelled by james baker essentially with this principle. Saddam borrowed money for military, didn't benefit the people, and knew the lenders, Eastern European countries in that case, knew about it. So it's all canceled. So there are cases where we can use this to repudiate a lot of the Global South debt. Colonial reparations, we have some historical precedents in small and not so small cases uh, in Namibia, in the case of uh, Israel and, and other cases. Uh, war reparations, which is a classic uh, example. So a lot of these existing frameworks can be adapted and adjusted to legally, in an orderly fashion, massively reduce the debt of the Global South. Uh, the principle of necessity, uh, the principle of impossibility, right? legal principles that are used in domestic cases, insurance law cases, and things like that, can't we think of the principle of necessity when it comes to climate change, when it comes to human rights issues related to access to food, access to basic human rights like health, the principle of impossibility, right? Which is again used in domestic insurance law cases. There are very clear parallels that can be used, should be used to make the case for debt cancellation, for transfer of technology, for reparations, for repairing the damage. And finally, I'll close with this and I'll open it up. We're running out of time. I'm also, I think, running out of time. The, the climate and inequality, all of these pulley crises that we're dealing with, they call for bold, urgent, radical transformation, not band-aid solutions, right? not tranquilizing drugs, not false solutions. And the current climate and development policies that unfortunately we're looking at are too weak, too slow, too expensive ineffective they don't even work and as a result they're dangerous because they're misleading us with false solutions and so a realistic plan for a just transition requires again the fundamental restructuring of the global economic trade investment architecture which is a legal architecture this is not just a, a bunch of economic decisions happening randomly there are legal frameworks the, the legal charters of the World Bank, of the IMF, of the, the WTO legal framework is purely extractive when it comes to its relationship to the Global South. Those are legal architectures. Uh, so I, I truly believe that this better world is within reach, like a, like a real Wakanda, right, is within reach. And I think it's possible, desirable, and affordable. Thank you so much. time we have. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to hang out here afterwards, but I know people have to go to classes and other things. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll take questions. Uh, let me take a scan of the room quickly. I'll start with you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, on the point of this being a legal framework, um, if you've seen uh, the recent um, proposed legislation in New York for um, that deals with sovereign debt restructuring, have you seen it, and do you have any thoughts? Um, and I think specifically it um, really looks at not necessarily governments, but um, like private um, creditors, you know, predatory creditors, and yes. kind of forcing them to take, yeah, specific restructuring. 
the, the short answer, I haven't seen it, as in like the actual documents, but it's a step in the right direction. I, my guess is that it doesn't go into the all the big transformation that I'm talking about. It's just specifically about, you know, companies that own, let's say, half of Africa's external debt here in New York, <laughs> to not to name them, right? The the predatory behavior. Uh, if anything can be done in this state, in this city, to help on that front, will be a welcome change. But it's not going to be sufficient in the bigger scheme of things. But yeah, when we talk about 50% of Africa's debt owned by one entity in this city, maybe we can do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a question here. Hi, um, I think that it's really like topical that you mentioned Ghana because that's where I'm from and also recently went through social unrest with sure. the um, protesting. Um, I think my question is how far how far can decolonization efforts go when the onus is on like global south countries to create that decolonization because yeah. I mean so far history has proven that that's not going to be something that will come from the global north. Yeah, that's a very good question. Another way I've heard this question and I've been engaged in these debates is, do you work within the Global North legal architecture and within the IMF and, and reform the system from within or do you build parallel structures? Uh, the short answer for me, because I thought about this a long time, it's a waste of time, I think, with, to be realistic, to try to work from within the system. Yes, we can achieve quite a bit. You can get the IMF to issue $650 billion worth of green SDRs and, and help. But the US is not going to give up its veto power within the IMF, uh, unless anything changed in the last few months when I was not paying attention to the US. Um, so it's not realistic. But when you build parallel structures with actual coherent long-term vision from a global south perspective, which is what we try to present in, in this report, you can make the existing structures irrelevant over time, obsolete, which forces them either to change in a good way and help, or just become obsolete and irrelevant and maybe disappear. I'm dedicating my effort on that parallel structure. Other people should still fight from within the system and try to deliver as much as possible. But I don't think realistically that's going to happen quickly enough. Yeah. Yes, please. Absolutely. Effective. Yep. So I know this. Um, I, I know exactly what you're talking all about. The food, but yeah. Do you have any sort of thoughts on if we are asking these countries to actually sort of do all this effort to be colonized? Yeah. How can we get them when the leaders are different? Uh, absolutely. And this is where, you know, educating, empowering, organizing, mobilizing people at the grassroots level is important. It's not going to come from the top. I'll give you a very quick example. Lebanon is not unique in this case. Let's say we want to invest in food sovereignty, right? Actually produce more food. Almost every country in the global south, Lebanon included, my own country included, every single country I looked at, there's usually four, maybe five people in the country who control the exclusive import license for wheat, for rice, for sugar, for oil, cooking oil and all that. And why would they let local farmers produce more locally and cut into their market share? They will use all the economic power and political influence they have legally and illegally to crush those ideas. And they do systematically. So it has to be a recognition and understanding from the grassroots but also from within the political system that you need to deal with these cartels, right? And call them out and fight them with enemies. In some cases, you may not be able to fight them because this is like a drug cartel in some cases with their logistical capabilities, media capabilities. So you may have to have strong political leadership that is willing to play dirty and you know strike deals and say, well, you can still make money if you invest in this policy will still let you rule, so to speak, economically, but
but slightly differently in a transformative way. Maybe, I don't know. It requires a lot of country by country thinking, but that's, you're, you're pointing to one of the main obstacles there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. My question is about the role of international law in sort of addressing or helping to address some of these challenges around climate change. And I'm particularly curious about the question of enforcement and the extent to which you can enforce, you know, certain sort of materializations of international law. So for example, the Paris Climate Accords, yeah. right? In reality, it's not really enforceable because there are no penalties for yeah. states that violate the accords. And there are also, there's also no governing body to sort of enforce compliance. Yeah. So how do you imagine navigating those challenges? And could that help with some of the solutions and suggestions that you give? Very good question. So there's multiple ways to, to address that and we should use all means. I'll just mention a couple maybe that can be helpful. One is, is what we present in this work, which is if you have that united front from a global south and saying we have all the strategic minerals, we have a debtors club, we have a critical minerals club, we have a global south vision and strategy, and we control all these resources, if you don't deliver on your promises, if you don't, then you don't have access to these things. And yeah, that will be met in some cases by violence, right? So that's, that's a reality. Uh, another way to use the existing legal infrastructure that we have where there is more transparency and more integrity and more prestige is something like the ICJ, the, the International Court of Justice within the UN, which is one of the most democratically established units within, with, with lots of uh, integrity and, and respect on a global scale to bring, I mean, to, to bring cases to them, it has to come from member states of the UN, right? And to ask for opinions, legal opinions. And you start, I mean, this is how international law works, right? Is with, with lots of institutional work that happens over time. So you have to bring more and more cases to the ICJ to build the legal precedents and, and, and opinions. In international law, also there's no international constitution. So speeches, statements from governments create the precedence and all of that. So we have to work on all of these fronts, build the international legal uh, framework and tradition and precedence and, for, and move towards treaties, which is why I support this um, fossil fuel phase out uh, treaty initiative because that's how international law moves, right? We didn't have nuclear non-proliferation treaty out of nowhere. It came from small developing countries that said this is, this is not going to happen to, to move into nuclear you know, proliferation. And that effort was successful, no matter what we think about it today. And maybe this effort should be just as successful on something that is of planetary, planetary existential importance. Um, so I don't know if that answers fully your question, but these are the things that, you know, we have multifaceted problems, very complicated politically, geopolitically, and they need multi-pronged solutions from, from all fronts. But with the idea of transformation, right? Yes. Yes, please. So I just want to build off of her question earlier about sort of the deep corruption in a yeah. lot of what you term the Global South. And I guess my question is, I wonder if Global South versus Global North is even the right framing. So if you think about the United States, like median wages here have been stagnant for 40, 50 years. Who's gotten really wealthy? The elites. The yeah. elites here are actually quite disloyal to the United States, as are the elites in India or any other of the, you know, sort of emerging Global South nations that you might say. They've benefited from what I believe you call neocolonialism probably more yes. um, than, than anyone else. So I guess why aren't you framing this in, in perhaps those more populist terms of global elites versus global middle class as opposed to global north versus global south? Completely, you know, well said. Uh, yes, there is a global south within the global north too in pockets of communities. The reason I... I still prefer to use global north and global south is because of that $2 trillion, the, the, the big flows of finance. But of course, a lot of it is happening, also extractivism and abuse in, in the global north itself. That's why when I talk about 
Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. It's at the national level for also internal grievances within the Global North. But more directly to, to your question, um, when you think of the restructuring and rebalancing that I was talking about to, to move, say, the Global South higher up the value chain, away from purely extractivism and, and assembly line manufacturing, that raises wages in the Global South in quality of life, and that stops the pressure, the neoliberal pressure here in the North on workers by continuously outsourcing and threatening to outsource their jobs and forcing workers here to accept lower wages and conditions. When you rebalance globally, it's a win-win for workers in the South, for workers in the North too. So that's also in a way addressing part of the problems of the Global South within the Global North. So well said, yes. We're out of time, but again, thank you, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you.